George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Marissa Saunders was the 2021 White Ribbon Campaign co-chair at Vera House. First woman in the history of the campaign. Now you might say, well, what's Vera House being, how does Vera House have the first woman? Well, because it's a campaign led by men. But Marissa asked the question, hey, I'd like to be involved in that process. And actually, uh, was very significantly involved. She was the honorary co-chair along with Dr. Iman Rahim uh, for the 2021 Vera House campaign. Uh, she's an activist in the community. She's a, a, a survivor, uh, and she'll tell you what she's a survivor of. She's a member of the Vera House Survivors Network, and she's here today to talk about her experience as an honorary co-chair of the White Ribbon Campaign and what that meant for her how it's transformed her, what she's learned about it, what was challenging about it, uh, and what her message is for you. A woman who, by the way, has her own consulting business, she does missionary work, and she helps uh, individuals and, and, and companies to really process interculturally and intersectionally. Did I get all that right? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, I'm on the board of Vera. Oh, well, yes. I'm the vice president. Yeah, yeah vice president of, of the yeah, Vera I'll House. I'll be the president next year. Yeah. My, the president pro tem, right? Oh, no, president mm -hmm. elect or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With all of that being said, and so, Marissa, uh, thank you for joining us on Inspiration for the Nation today. Actually, this is your second time on the show, right? Because mm -hmm. the last time we had you and Iman on, uh, we talked about the very powerful, uh, well, we we didn't do it yet, but we now can talk about uh, the experience that you, if you choose to share of you telling your truth at one of our training sessions. Uh, so anyway, Marissa, how you doing? What you want to say to the people? Hey, people. <laughs> hey, my peoples. Um, I am actually excited to be here with you again and having another opportunity to really just talk and to share um, a little bit more about my journey. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I, I like to phrase this work that I do. It's all mm -hmm. a part of a journey um, to uh, answer the call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there was a moment where I just decided, you know, I'm all in when it comes to doing what I'm purposed to do. Mm -hmm. I'm all in. Um, and that all in means I'm all in, not just for others, but I'm all in for myself. So selfishly, I accepted being the honorary chair for the White Ribbon Campaign uh, this year. Um, and when I say selfishly, it's because I got so much out of it. Mm -hmm. I knew that doing that, it was going to do something. It was going to be transformational, um, not just for others, um, but also for myself. And, and it was. It's being the honorary chair, being the first woman, um, and then being a survivor um, to, as a part of a campaign that was geared, just geared towards speaking to men. Mm -hmm about male masculinity and then having um, a voice of a, of a female identified uh, survivor, I think was important. What, did, what were the things and the revelations that you learned during this process? How were that you being um, a survivor is powerful um, and it can be impactful and impactful in a way of once you get to that other side of being a survivor, the, for me, it meant I have to speak my truth now. I have to use my voice, my story as a way to impact others in some way. Um, and for me, if only one person got it through my story, I'm good. I've done what I was called to do. I'm, I'm, I've done what, um, I know I was purposed to do. And the other piece is that I know that everything I've been through was for that moment. Mm. Everything for this moment. For this moment. For tomorrow. It was never just for um, not. You know, that, 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 that word that everything 
is for the good. It can turn out for the good for those who trust and believe. And I held on to a lot of faith through a lot. And um, that the White Ribbon Campaign was a platform that I prayed for. Mm. My prayer has always been, Lord, help me and provide me opportunities and platforms that are larger than my dreams and myself. Um, and that are large enough to reach others that I might not be able to reach. I can go down the street every day. I can knock on people's doors, but he provided, there was a platform that was provided um, to see myself on the news while I'm at the gym and I realize people are looking at me and it doesn't help that I have a Vera House face mask on, you know, mask on as well. <laughs> so to be in the gym, to be in the grocery stores and having the second looks and um, you know, passing out the, the wristbands to people and just, you know, just being me. Um, you shared that, and you've been telling your story. What is it that you want people to know about your truth? My truth is that I am a survivor of both domestic and sexual violence. Um, I was sexually assaulted two years ago. I was in a domestic violence marriage. I have been in violence um, against my body um, mm. since I was a kid, but didn't understand it, didn't realize it. And from that, it, it moved into violence as a teenager. I was uh, sex trafficked from 15 to 16 years of age. Um, and, and I have to say something. I didn't realize the depths of my trauma and or abuse until I took a Vera House training through um, a, a job. When I was working at CCA, I had my staff and I, we had to do, um, I wanted us to make sure we did a, a, um, a training around youth and domestic violence and sexual violence and, and sex trafficking and all of that. And it was in that training that I started hearing the stories of the other people there, that the other women, the other young boys, the young men telling their stories triggered, oh, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. That scene sounds familiar. And it was, that was when I discovered, um, and it was about five years ago is when I was like, wait a minute, I was sex trafficked. That's what that was. Oh, wait a minute, I was sexually assaulted. That was date rape. That's when I started being able to put language to what would had happened to me. We're talking with Marissa Saunders, Vice President of the Board at Vera House. She's got a lot of titles. Uh, and will be the President of the Board next year. Aren't you also on the foundation as well? I am. Yeah, so. <laughs> I am. You're, uh, it, uh, of the Vera House Foundation, uh, which is the fundraising arm of the organization and uh, or a separate fundraising. I'm a trustee. Yeah, I'm yeah, a trustee. Trustee. Yeah. trustee representative from the board, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, is it that, because you spoke about earlier about the violence against your body, is it that you had accepted that as the norm? And you and oh, that definitely. You, had, you had normalized that the sex, sex trafficking, the de domestic violence, as well as the date rape as just part of, like, is that, or did, did, it, did it seem wrong at the time? No, never seemed wrong. Mm. Um, the, the sex That's trafficking- That's powerful, right? It, it, it was normalized for myself um, because I had learned how to disconnect myself. Mm. So I was never there. It was never me a part of it. It was just my body. Mm. And so I learned how to disconnect myself from my body, which meant I disconnected myself from my emotions, which meant I disconnected myself from the mental anything, right? And the physical anything that was going on. I learned how to disassociate myself from pain. Was that survival, you think? It was str strictly survival mode. It was strictly survival mode. The times where I was sex trafficked, I was a runaway youth. Mm. I was running away from home. And men came to me. And because I needed a place to stay, because I wanted a place to stay, because I didn't want to be at home, I, I, I accepted it. I accepted whatever was happening to myself to survive. And it became such, nor it became so normalized that even when I wasn't being abused, the fear of being abused would cause me to give in even when I didn't want to. So it's almost like a perpetual 
victimization and re-victimization even in that moment right even it's in all, that moment but not even being able to identify that i'm but not able, you can yeah you can articulate it now in hindsight mm-hmm. but so many women who may be or survivors i will say who might be listening to your story survivors of all gender identity might be resonating with you what would be a way for you to help them connect to the disconnection if that's for lack of a better word that you experienced because somebody might be listening who has had that experience uh and while i say that i should also let people know that as we're listening to this the vera house has a 24-hour hotline here's the number 315-468-3260 and if you also want to chat I believe we have, uh, depending upon when you're listening to this, the chat service is available, I believe, till 11 p.m. Eastern time. Now, what would you say to someone, or what would you have said to yourself if you knew something, if you were that aware then? What would you say to the younger uh, Marissa who was who was disconnecting from her body, who did not make that connection? What, do you, what did you say, what are you saying now about that? And what would you say to somebody who might be in this moment experiencing exactly what you did? That the shame and guilt that you might be feeling right now is normal. Mm. And it doesn't mean that you asked for it. It doesn't mean that you wanted it. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're dirty. It doesn't mean that you're unworthy. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that you surviving was wrong. Mm. That's powerful. And I think I carried a lot of that, um, that there was so much shame wrapped around in my body and it caused me to have an eating disorder. And, you know, the, the, the community of color does not talk about eating disorders, but I had a binge eating. I was a binge eater. That is an eating disorder. I chose and turned to food in such an unhealthy manner. Um, I turned to so many other things that were so unhealthy because of the shame I carried around and I carried it within my body. Were you trying to punish your body? I wouldn't say I was, no, I was trying to comfort my body. Oh, the comfort the body, but then the result of it for you might have well, I, I I use the word punishment, but maybe that's not the you said that's not no, the word. No, punish is not definitely not the word. I that's not the word. I you when when you're going through this, you're searching for anything to keep you numb mm. and to keep comfort. And you define the comfort for yourself. For me, it was food. When you said that don't feel shame because you survived. Did you ever have thoughts that you wanted to end your own life? I tried three times. Mm. I tried three times. And a lot of people don't know that. I um, ran my car off of a highway um, and landed on another highway in the opposite direction in the middle of the night in the dark. And there were no cars on either side of the highway. Car was not damaged. I just turned it around and went to the next exit and got off the exit and went home. Um, I backed my car up into a a, a tree and my taillight was broken, that was it. And I took, um, I tried to overdose on pills and somehow or other, um, I was found by someone, they uh, caused me to vomit and um, called an ambulance and they took me away and I chose to stay in a in a psychiatric unit for a week and I slept and I rested um and I slept some more and I rested some more and I I realized then that I was so exhausted from surviving I was exhausted 
people don't realize when they talk about, oh, you're, you're stealing, you're this, you're that, and, 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 and people who have PTSD and people who are walking around in survival mode, no one gets how exhausting it is. So to say that we're just, you know, that, uh, that someone is just, oh, they're just taking the easy away, surviving is exhausting and it's not easy at all. And so part of survival might be trying to anesthetize through a variety of means. A variety of means. Right. A right. variety of means. Um, you know, I, I, my, mine, mine, I had a couple, but food became my friend. Mm. Food never told me no. Mm -hmm. food never told me I wasn't good enough food never told me no one would want me food never told me that I was only good for food never told me anything bad as a woman food embraced me mm -hmm. food embraced me as a woman of color I don't know if you I'm gonna ask you you can share this if you choose but uh, we were at a session and a very powerful moment happened in that session. Do you want to share that set, that moment? I think we can co-share it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can share that I, you know, um, volunteered to come and speak uh, in this group, in the 12, in the 12 men model group. And um, I came on a day that the session was about sexual violence. And I shared my story of being sexually assaulted. Um, but I went a little deeper as to what it looked like and felt like for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I shared the, the part of it that I believe a lot of people are mistaking about. And, 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 and victims and, and perpetrators, offenders. My body wasn't mine at that moment. So any reaction was involuntary. And our bodies are made, our bodies are made to respond to things. And, and in some cases, especially um, when it comes to, um, sex, your body will automatically respond. And so I, growing up and going through all of this, I always felt so guilty for my body responding because in those responses, that individual who is victimizing me would take that response as a yes, would take that as a response as wanting, would take that response away from the no away from that verbal no, away from that initial no, away from that initial pushing off though, away from that initial. And so when I shared a lot of that and I shared the, what I was going through in my mind um, because I went outside of my body. You know, when it was over, I just remember slowly coming back into myself and then wondering what the hell just happened. And then even the next day, when I realized I was bruised up, still not really connecting it. And the moment I connected was a few days later. Hmm. And it wasn't until I was talking to a good friend that I realized, wait a minute. Okay, wait, 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 wait. And then when it hit me the hardest was I was actually at Vera House, getting ready to do some work with Vera House. And I, I stopped and I said, wait, I think I was sexually assaulted. And, you know, and I, I, I just remember being in that men's group and I just wanted, I, I felt like I had an opportunity to actually get someone to understand this is what actually is happening to that individual who you believe wants you mm -hmm. because their body is reacting to your pressure, to your pressure. And if someone is coming with a, a, a background in violence, you have to know that for me, giving in is also survival. It's survival. 
giving in means I won't be beat up. Giving in means I won't get hit upside the head or smacked in the face or pushed down and I won't be forced because the force stuff was hard. Um, and so you learn how to navigate and shift so that you don't get hurt even more. Mm -hmm. And I remember just sharing that and there was silence. Oh, yeah. There was just silence. And when I looked, I saw men crying. And I, I remember, I don't think I could keep the tears as I was describing everything. And I wanted to be as vivid and visual as I possibly could so that they could feel it. And it was the most difficult thing I think I might have ever done. Wow. But I knew I had to because I had, remember, I asked God for the platforms. Mm. I asked for the platforms. And I had to take advantage of the platform. And there was a response. There was a response. There was a response. And that response, again, keeping the uh, what's in the room in the room, but you received an apology. I did. And not from anyone who had harmed me. No. And the significance of that apology, I'm starting to tear up now thinking about it, but the significance of that apology for you was what? He apologized for all the other men. He apologized and gave me the apology. I didn't know I even needed. Mm. Right? I didn't even know I needed that apology. But what that apology also did is in that moment, I felt the chains break off of me and it freed me. Mm. Oh my God, it freed me. It freed me. I didn't even know I had been such a prisoner, but it's that apology freed me and I started breathing. Mm. I didn't even know I had been walking around holding my breath all of these years. Since I was five, I had been holding my breath. Wow. And we should say it wasn't gratuitous. It was as sincere as anyone could be. And it was through tears that, they, I mean, I, I, I think as much as it was liberating for you, it was liberating for them as well. To hear the light bulbs go off. That was a whole nother thing to hear. I heard the light bulbs go click, what? And I heard from many of the men in that room say, I didn't realize that what I might've been doing was, I didn't realize that what I've been doing is, and that was powerful. To be in a, in a room with men who heard me, One. because that's what you have to understand. When this is happening to you, you're not being heard. And so for the first time, I was being heard. When you think about, and, and all of this is part of the, your role, right? I mean, I don't know if you signed up for this. We should also say to people that we didn't just put you in that space like that. And <laughs> we did provide uh, some from support for you. But what, what she's talking about, we were in a session where we where men are engaged in conversation. We work with faith communities. We work with um, corporate. We work with all kinds of communities, colleges, campuses. We work with communities throughout this uh, region and the country soon uh, to to engage men in conversation in through our twelve men model, and Marissa, as the first woman co chair, we, we we've been recently asking men. It started with the mayor and the county executive, 
uh, last year. You, you see my eyes of water, right? You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're both over here trying to keep it together. I'm like, where's my kids? Well, eyes are all watery, and I ain't mad about it either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we it's we asked them if they're going to be honorary co-chairs, then we need you to put a group together. And so the challenge was, well, how do we do this with Marissa? Marissa said, I'm going to get a group. And she did. And I said, yes. And guess what else we want to do? We want to have you come and speak live. And she said, yes, I'll do it. And I'll tell my truth. I, I, I can do this one. I could do that one. And and, and Marissa agreed to, to speak to other groups um, and, 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 and shed a light on this. Because, right, like, for example, right now, we have a, a situation where Syracuse University lacrosse players, for example, uh, there was a alleged incident of domestic violence and some of the players took to social media to state that they would, that they're now playing to raise awareness about the issue of domestic violence in particular. And our very own, our very own, what hat am I wearing? I work at Verehouse too. Um, Amanda Estevez sent a letter to the editor commending those players because it's part of the reason why this continues to happen. Not speaking specifically about that case at SU, there's an investigation, whatever is going to come to light will come to light. We also know that there was an arrest for another charge of criminal mischief. We don't know if that's related at all to the initial charges with the young man who's been identified. But one of the reasons why rape culture and a culture of silence continues is because of the well-meaning men who stand by while the jokes, while the actions and all of that is being committed in full view and they know what's going on. And so what these players did and or what the symbolism is of, of, of these players is they believed that something untoward happened and they weren't going to stand for it. Again, allegations, we don't know what happened. And, 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 but what, but in, in everyday life, situations are happening when the rest of us, the nine out of 10 of us or the two out of 10 of us who ain't doing the stuff uh, or who have to work towards not doing the stuff, right? Because we're all capable, right? Wait, wait, you see that? We're all capable, don't trip. We got to do our work too. Don't even trip. I had to. I had to stop that. I was like, "Hold up." <laughs> Hold because up. remember, that's what the men were saying. They were like, "Wait, I had no idea that right. that's what I was doing because right. there's no language to it." There's no language to it. So we're putting some language to it, mm -hmm. and we're asking you to step up, and we're asking you to look around and say, "May and and look, you may have done. We you may have caused harm in the past. Don't trip. You may have." But the question is, now that you know, right? What, 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 we, what we say, Marissa, now that you know better, you can do, do better. better. You right? are now accountable. You are now accountable. And just like I'm a trainer and a facilitator, look, I'm accountable like everybody else. Because when I'm standing before uh, groups, I'm as accountable as you are because mm -hmm. I can't, you, it's one thing for me to stand up there and then go home and be like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it don't work like that. Oh, and by the way, my family will quick remind me, oh, you, oh, you, Vera House, huh? <laughs> okay, they will give it to you. How are you feeling today? You've liberated, you've gone through this. How are you feeling now? Honestly, I am still struggling. It is still a process. What I am so grateful for is that it gave me an opportunity towards more healing. So mm -hmm. this kind of, um, uh, uh, it, it, it pushed it, it pushed me, it challenged me, it stretched me, but it also helped me get to the other side. So I'm, I'm healing. It helped me to heal because the more I had to talk about it, I never want to be desensitized from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be around people and they become so, and I don't want, I, I don't know if they are, but it appears that way. And I never want to appear that way. I can now, I mean, look, I was interviewed, I think two times a week for maybe two months. Mm -hmm. 
from radio, newspaper, you know, everything, right? I had to do videos. I had to do everything. And I want to I want to shout out to Solon Quinn. I have to shout him out. He provided me something and 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 I I, I need to say this as a survivor and as someone who struggled with body image because of all of this assault against and violence against my body, I struggled with body image and I still struggle with it. And But one of the things that I had always desired to do is to have a photo shoot and I never would do it. I would try to do it and would just never, and I would never do it because I never wanted to see my body. I never wanted to see myself. And because of the white ribbon campaign, we had to do a video and we had to do photos. And I was like, I don't wanna do this. I was scared. Oh, I was so scared. I had so much fear. It was a, a, a gigantic fear that I never told anyone. Only God knew how afraid I was. And I walked into that space with Solon and Solon just created this space of safety and comfort and empathy and compassion that I was able to be completely my authentic self. And then he started taking photos and in the middle of it, I just, when we finished, I said, you have no idea what you just did. And he said, what? I said, you just liberated me because I just did something else I've been afraid to do. Like I had been afraid to tell my story thoroughly mm -hmm. until Vera House. Mm -hmm. And so that point, and that's where the photo that everyone saw was he was like, can I capture this moment? And I, I questioned it. And then I said, nope, if I'm questioning it because I'm scared, that means I need to do it. And so I did it. And he just snapped all of these shots of me. And when he finished, I was a puddle of tears. He was in tears. And it was just a moving moment. So Soul and Quinn from Soul and Quinn Studios, thank you for capturing my journey towards healing. Would you, I, lastly, speak to women of color who... Mm. Talk to, talk to the sisters. My God, my God, my God, my sisters. I don't even know where to begin. What I will tell you is that you are so amazingly beautiful and powerful and funny and loving. And we have this capacity to survive through anything, but I will challenge you to no longer just survive. Mm. I will challenge you to stand up and into every bit of fear that you are feeling that is holding you, that has become an obstacle towards your healing. Turn to someone that you trust, call Vera House, look me up on Facebook, Marissa Miss Missy Saunders, and, and start speaking your truth because I'm telling you, there's freedom in that. There's healing in that. It will help to remove the shame. It will help to remove the guilt. And let me be clear, you did nothing wrong. And it is not your fault. Your beautiful black and brown body is still beautiful black and brown body. It is gorgeous so much so that others look to emulate it. Understand that what you hold inside of you is no longer just for you. Every bit is to give back to the world, share it so that you can help someone else get to the other side. Marissa, Miss Missy, Saunders, <laughs> if you need help or support right now, 24 hour hotline, the Vera House in Syracuse is 315-468-3260. And if you're watching this out of town, we can connect you to the uh, agency in your area. Again, 315-468-3260. Your journey is your journey and it can begin whenever you want. Marissa Saunders is the vice president of the board at Vera House. She's also a foundation trustee and she was the honorary 2021 white, or was it 2020? Which one was it? 2021, yeah, 2021. <laughs> White Ribbon, because we did some stuff last year. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> 2021 White Ribbon Campaign Co-Chair. And um, Marissa, we thank you for sharing your truth with the audience and for somebody who today will feel liberated for the very first time. I know there's somebody, there's one. 
There's just, and, and you know what? We'll take one. One causes a ripple effect. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Marissa Saunders on Inspiration for the Nation.